So today we are talking about a Christian work ethic. Christian work ethic. Before we get into that, I want to just highlight a couple things. You know, I like to do that. Um, We have uh, some things that have been going on in the world that have possibly stirred a few of you. Maybe a little consternation, little stresses. If you've turned on the news or if you've watched YouTube, uh, there are a lot of things that are circulating on the internet about many things that are happening in the world. And uh, some, some of those, uh, we've heard the rhetoric with Iran and their retaliation possibly against Israel and against U.S. assets and so forth, especially in the time of Ramadan. Ramadan ends on Tuesday, so there's uh, usually an increase of violence right at the end, so that's got people stirred up. Uh, then we've heard about the Temple Institute and their initiative trying to push forth to build the third temple, which the Bible calls the abomination of desolation. It's not commissioned by God. They will try to build it to usher in the messianic age, and so they want to sacrifice a red heifer to implement this, to purify, to ready for it. None of that will happen outside of God's perfect timing. They've been trying to do that for a while. You've probably been sick of hearing about red heifers over the last few years. It's like, are we still talking about a red cow? Well, it's part of Numbers chapter 19, and again, the Temple Institute has wanted to do this for quite some time. So now they seem to be a little more serious, and now they bought some land across on the Mount of Olives, and if they can't do it there, the government in Israel is telling them not to do it, and so they may go out to Shiloh to actually do that sacrifice, or monitoring it carefully. But again, None of this will happen outside of God's appointed time. They could sacrifice that cow, and God said, nope, not yet. And years go by, so we've got to be very careful. There's a lot of sensationalism on the internet right now. That never happens. A lot of people who claim to be experts. We've got to be very careful. You know where we find our expertise? (laughs) Right here. God's holy word. That's how we navigate it. Sometimes we get frustrated because we don't feel like all the details that we want, all the juicy details that we want exactly the timing of everything and every detail that's going to come about, we want it here. And if it's not there, we're going to turn to somebody who thinks they have a new prophecy to give us. And you need not to turn to those sources. The Lord tells us exactly what we need to know, and we trust Him. In addition to all these things, some people have been upset about Mercury slowing down or the appearance of slowing down. I don't know if you heard about that, Mercury retrograde. (laughs) How about the eclipse on Monday? You haven't heard about that one yet, have you? No, No, I didn't think so. Or the bridge falling in Baltimore, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and people saying, that's the symbolism of America. We're all going to fall down by a big, you know, container ship, going to take the whole country down. No, I mean, I get it. There's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety about these things. And we hear somebody who seems like they know what they're talking about. And of course, simultaneously, we do get a pulse that things are changing in America. There seems to be a disdain for the things of God. So we are expecting judgment to come upon us at any moment. So we're just waiting. It's got to be tomorrow or he'll owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology, right? We've heard that one for quite some time. I would encourage you, we did a radio program that aired this morning, and you can listen to it again at calvaryfountain.com. And it's only 25 minutes. I know trying to get 25 minutes is hard sometimes, but it's audio, so maybe you can plug it in, take a listen. And we try to cover some of these things from a biblical worldview. That's what we have to do when these things come upon us. So here's the bottom line. Let me give you a few verses. Bottom line, 2 Timothy 1.7. The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How do you have a sound mind? Are you born with it? Some of you, maybe, right? But it's not. We're born in the flesh, and we think like the flesh, and we act like the flesh. To have a sound mind comes by the Holy Spirit that gives us discernment and understanding. He has given us what we need to know, and this is a gift from God when we have understanding. And then we're not to be shaken. He tells the people of Israel not to be afraid. Listen to these words, Isaiah 41, 13. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, I will help you. Do you trust him? Do you feel like you can almost lean over and you just feel like God's presence holding your hand right now and just saying, do you trust me? I've got you. No matter how difficult the days may be, I've got you. And I will carry you through, just as he did for Israel when they were in Goshen, 
in the land of Egypt. He carried them through. He'll carry you through as well. Remember this. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4.4. 4. Do not be shaken. Do not give in to these fears and doubts. and They can be crippling and stressful and rob you of your joy in the Lord. Even if it all did fall apart tomorrow, the world can have it. You know where you're going. If you're in Christ Jesus, you know He will provide. He will equip. He will strengthen you for the journey. You have a mission to do. As long as there is breath in your body, there is work to be done. That's why today we're talking about a Christian work ethic. And what we're going to look at is on a micro level what that ethic does, and on a macro level how all things can be changed by Christians who are implementing this. Cities changed. Nations changed. And be reminded that when he was writing to Thessalonica, it was a little, not a little, about 200,000 people living in a town, and it will change the entire town. Not only does it change the entire town, it changes an entire nation, to which the emperor of Rome has to get involved because of what Christians were up to, what Christians were speaking, what Christians were doing. Imagine if that happened here in Colorado Springs and then filtered out and cascaded into the rest of the nation. God can do it. He needs a willing people to do what He has called us to do. So let's pray. Let's get into His Word, shall we? Heavenly Father, Almighty God, again, we thank You for the great privilege to be able to gather with the saints here today. We ask, Father, that You'd please give us understanding of Your Word, and it not be from men, from my lips, that we hear today. I pray, Father, that it's only from You that You would bathe this whole thing with Your spoken Word, that it is only You we hear from, and it is from You we are convicted by Your Word. And stirred to action and mobilized and equipped to do what you have called us to do. I pray, Father, you receive all the glory and praise. Give us a zeal for your word once again. May we understand and may we leave here changed by it. We ask, Lord, that you would please be with the things in this world that are bigger than us, it feels. And we put our prayers in this little bucket as if we think that they're not effective. Forgetting that we are praying to the creator of the universe. And we ask, Father, that if there are leaders, and we know there are, in our state and in our nation that do not honor you and blaspheme your name, I pray that you would remove them and bring up another. Restore us anew, O Lord. I pray that you would do the same with these who call themselves leaders at the United Nations, and they turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to all sorts of atrocities while calling out Israel. Father, I pray that in the midst of all these things, that righteousness would prevail. Somehow, in the midst of it all, for these who are hostages, and I've seen their faces, some of them at least, and I see the bruised faces, I pray, Lord, that you would return them home safely. I pray, Father, that you would give wisdom to leaders who even elevate fists before you. Father, would you steer them rightly, and we know you will. You'll bring all things to your perfect plan and timing. I do pray for the salvation of those in Israel. I pray for the salvation of those in Ishmael. I pray for salvation in Ukraine and salvation in Russia. Lord, would you bring your hand to move mightily and equip the missionaries to be effective in giving the gospel. Protect them that no harm would come upon them as they give the message. Defend them, protect them, and may they be like a megaphone to their lips to give the message. I pray, Father, that the word go forth unhindered. The enemy be frustrated. Father, we ask that it would begin right here today in our backyard, that we be a people of prayer, living faithfully, doing as we ought to do, and having the right Christian work ethic to you be the glory. We say this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. My desire here is that the word would convict us. I don't want to cause offense. I may offend, and I apologize somewhat for that. Um, it's hard because as we go through God's Word, sometimes it offends us, and sometimes, rightfully so, it should offend sin. But sometimes I might say something that we may disagree with, and and what I want you to understand here is that from a micro level to a macro level, my intent here is to show the power of God's Word that impacts entire societies. Even atheists will find themselves doing certain things that actually came out of God's Word, and they didn't even know it. Men aren't born inherently good. 
They're not. According to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who said that men are born inherently good, he never had children, apparently. Um, because men are not born inherently good. If you leave two toddlers in a room, unequipped, untrained, they will show you gross humanity. And, and that's what we should expect. We have to be trained. We have to understand what is right and what is wrong. And then we have to practice those things so that children will follow behind and do likewise. Any dog lovers here? It's an interesting transition. Talk about kids and then dogs. Um, Dog lovers, this is wonderful though. We have, uh, we've had dogs, we've had Yorkies, and I know they're not really dogs, but they look like dogs, they think they're dogs. The interesting thing is, for those of you who are dog lovers, you know how this works. The first dog is very difficult to train, isn't it? A potty train, the whole thing, and the practices of when to go to sleep, and when to behave, and not yap, and all these sort of things, you gotta train them. But if you get another dog that follows the first dog, training goes a whole lot easier. Why is that? Ah, because they're modeling and learning from the other one, right? You get a third dog, same thing. It gets easier each time. And so the same thing happens in a culture. When you drop in truth into a culture and it's like cascading out, it changes everything. And that's what the Bible has done time and time again. America at one point started off with the right foundation. But at some point along the way, things kept getting skewed. I would suspect that there are many in this room who have grown up in maybe some conservative home environments and hardworking families. You probably would lean on the direction that says that at some point, a good work ethic was a defining factor in the American way of life. I had grandparents, a grandfather, great-grandfather, in fact, who would have mud on his boots and calluses under his fingers, under his, right here on the palm of his hands, and he was unashamed of it. He worked hard. He taught me and the family a good work ethic. He didn't make excuses, didn't complain, showed up to work on time, and knew it was his duty. It was a virtue. It was a moral responsibility to do for others. Now, sometimes when we talk about work, we can talk about something like this and suddenly skew heavily into, well, you mean I need to work 24 hours a day. And then we get defined by our work and we have imbalance in our lives. And you can probably talk to my wife. I'm not the expert in this because it's very easy to get so caught up into what we do, we don't have a work-life balance. In addition, when we talk about work, we can start to think about what we do monetarily. Now, that's not what we're talking about here either. We're talking about a right work ethic that means as long as there's breath in your body, you are using it to the glory of the Lord. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're going to be a janitor, you mop to the glory of the Lord. You answer phones in customer service, you do it to the glory of the Lord because you represent a better king and a better kingdom. That's what we're going to draw out of this. Whether you make money in the process or not, we need to be put to work because God has a mission for you if you're still breathing. But sometimes we forget that we arise for a purpose. God has something for you to do. It doesn't matter if you're retired. I've had people, and what is retirement in the kingdom after all? <laughs> I don't read that part. Uh, that must be in First Billy. Uh, chapter 3 here. I don't see retirement in the Bible. I, I think what we find here is that even when your occupation changes, whether it goes from making money to maybe not making money and you've amassed enough money, you're still working. You still have something to do for the kingdom. When I've been in hospitals even, I have uh, sat with individuals who maybe didn't even have the full use of their extremities and wondered, what is my purpose? I said, you know what, in this moment, in this one particular individual, I said, do you have a tape recorder? Okay, we don't use tapes anymore. Okay, maybe your phone. How about drag and dictate? Have you ever heard that on your phone? It will transcribe what you speak into your phone. And then you can use it to actually print manuscripts from. So you have a story to tell. All of you have a testimony. If you're in Jesus Christ, you have been able to see, look how God has moved through my life. And I want to share this with the generations to come. Even in that, you can find purpose. Let me tell you about Jesus who transformed my life. I can't even use my arms right now. And Johnny Erickson Tato would say, well, what's the excuse in that? 
right? If you have breath in your body, you can still be used for the glorious purposes of God. We need purpose, but we need a good Christian work ethic. We need a right understanding of what that means from God's holy word. So you know me, I I love history. So I thought uh, this would be a good morning to just dump a whole bunch of history on you. Did you come ready to, 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 you know, did you turn on the thinking cap this morning? I'll try not to give you too much history, but just a little bit. It's fun. Something about America that was unique amongst the nations, and not entirely all that different from Israel. Israel was unique by way of covenant with God. But America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. In 1620, William Bradford and the brave men and women aboard the Mayflower wrote what's called the Mayflower Compact. And before they were to touch foot on the soil in America, they said these words that America was, and you won't find this necessarily in textbooks. In fact, I've seen textbooks where they edit this out. And here's what it says. America to be for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That's what it was established to do. George Washington said that the twin pillars essential for supporting a successful society are these two things. Ready? Morality and religion. You need those two things to have a successful society. Not just any religion. It was John Adams, our second president, who said, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. But we are at this point in America's history where we are rapidly abandoning the traditional work ethic. We are rapidly degenerating right before our eyes the very Christian roots The Christian influence of our society is being rooted out. And we should expect that unless there is a supernatural change of the hearts and minds of people in this nation, it will continue to digress. Why is that? Here's the shocking reason. In our society, God doesn't matter anymore. He matters to you. But in our society, do you see Him elevated from the rooftops? Do you see Him on the news? Do you hear him from the lips of congressmen and women, or even from our president? I have proclamations from governors that sound like a sermon on Sunday. Back in the 1800s, what's happened? Where have we gone? Why is it that we're so shocked by the increase of crime, so shocked by the increase of violence and all sorts of domestic disputes and domestic violence and all sorts of things. And now it's not a matter of if people steal, but how much can they steal? And I just ask a manager at Walmart how much they deal with on a daily basis. Why is this? Because if God doesn't matter, then there's no standard for morality. There's no standard of a transcend transcendence, did I say that right? Transcendent authority. You need this for any society, and those who founded this nation knew that. Today we're finding that evil is called good, and good is called evil. You know, back in 1647, there was actually an act that was passed in Massachusetts called the Old Deluder Satan Act. (laughs) Go back and look that one up. It's what actually established the public school system in America because they understood that Satan was the one who wanted to blind and deceive, and so the whole public school system was developed so that children could learn to read and write and read not anything but understand the Bible. And if they could understand the Bible, they would be good citizens. If they could understand the Bible, then they would understand what it means to sacrifice for their neighbor, to live a life of cause and purpose, and to hold the government accountable to the Word of God. Go back and look that up, 1647, the old deluder Satan act. I didn't make it up of all these things. We know that a good government, a strong society is dependent on these two pillars, In fact, it was Benjamin Franklin in 1780s who told Thomas Paine the same thing. He knew that. When he was imploring Thomas Paine to not write the age of reason, he said this, if men are so wicked with religion, imagine them without. 
And we're not talking about just religion for the sake of religion. We're talking about relationship with God, to know the will of God, to implement the things of God. You need this for sound governments, governance in, in life in a free world. But when you take away the things, the moral standards in our culture, we lose all the definition of things that we call to be good or moral. Society becomes infested with dishonesty, debauchery, self-indulgence, cheating, stealing, fearless immorality, and all the ways of sinful man. When God doesn't matter anymore, there is no transcendent standard for behavior. People once worked hard because of the influence of Scripture. Dare I say that? You, you may be questioning that right now, and you think, well, wait a minute. Not everybody was a Christian in America. No, but if you had a definition of what is good, what is right, and what is wrong, even those who were born into that society then understand that opening a car door for a woman is a good thing to do. Who tells them that? That's an honorable thing, as the Lord tells us as we look out, even for our neighbors, even for our elderly, that we respect authority. When people had a reverence for biblical authority, a basic fear of God, they respected people in authority. Imagine that. People respecting law enforcement, respecting those who are above them in some way who have been tasked with a responsibility like teachers and mayors, bosses. They respect authority because the Bible tells them so. And they would learn to behave honorably, even loving their, their neighbor even as much as they love themselves. And the Bible teaches these things. You know, it's a scientific fact that just reading the Bible improves your mental health. Scientific fact. Why is that? Even if you didn't believe anything in it and you just read it, for the poetry, the wisdom, the history, and the science alone will radically change your brain. And so far it's been proven that even just reading the book of Psalms will improve the wavelengths of your brain. It's powerful. But without the Word of God, civilized society crumbles. This is not on your screen. I just remembered this one, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. The apostle Paul tells Timothy, look what happens at the end of days. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You don't get there overnight. When we stop doing what the Word told us to do in Deuteronomy 6 and Psalm 78, that we take this truth bomb and we drop it into our culture and we do what it says to do, it will impact your children and your children's children. And they will do these things even if they don't understand where it came from. Well, Grandpa did it, so that's why I'm doing it. And suddenly you have replication throughout a culture of doing something good when they didn't even know the source. And it came right out of God's Word. And so because we didn't do these things and we start to applaud sin, oh, and freedom of expression and all these things and this woke culture, and we celebrate all these things, then what we're saying is that it's only moral relativism. Your truth is your truth. Their truth is their truth. There is no solid foundation of what is true, and you have a society of chaos. I haven't even started the sermon yet. <laughs> the reason why I bring all this up is because if sin is left unchecked, it impacts the entirety of the workplace. Your attitudes are different toward work. Again, we're not just talking about going to a job from 8 to 5 or whatever that is. Your attitude about work as a whole is different because your attitude toward God and a fear of God and His Word is wrong. Therefore, an attitude is needing an adjustment. See, if we don't understand where the good is defined, where moral virtue is defined of God's holy Word, sin is left unchecked. It doesn't like to be constrained. And then it's unleashed in the environment without checks and balances. And then workers are disdaining their bosses. They show up to work with bad attitudes. They're difficult to work with. And they make the lives of those around them miserable. Anybody work with these people? I hope you're not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Counseling. 
capitalism becomes replaced with socialism when people eliminate accountability to God. They start to bring on entitlements. They have this attitude that I should be paid just for existing. I should be entitled to all of these things, and somebody else should pay the bill. I don't have to work. It's really about somebody else's work. You know, our nation, interestingly, was founded with individuals who understood that we were under God. Twenty-one of the founding fathers used the term under God when talking about the affairs of our nation. They understood that this nation didn't prosper, nothing would go right, there would be no victory at war. None of these things would happen if you were not rightly under God, and that is true for your home as well. I remember reading about George Washington. He was so concerned about God's blessing upon the army that he wouldn't even allow the soldiers to cuss. If they cussed, they were disciplined because he knew that the aroma would be offensive to God. Can you believe that? Can you imagine walking into the army today with no cussing people? They wouldn't know how to communicate. I'll tell you that, you know, as you go through this study with me, you'll find that sometimes just applying the basics will make a huge difference. When I was working in construction, we know how a construction environment can be, they'll use one bad word in all sorts of different ways. And that's how they communicate with one colorful metaphor. And that's what they use. And when you don't do that, suddenly you're set apart. Yep. Suddenly they're like, wait a minute, something about this guy. And suddenly I'm pouring concrete. I have mixer drivers pull up to my truck and they, they want to tell me, ask me advice about their marriage. I was 17. <laughs> what did I know about marriage? But at the same time, they're like, there's something about integrity in this person that they're not willing to sound like everybody else. I can trust them and talk with them. Just one thing. And it wasn't because Ephesians 4.29 was sticking in my brain. It's because my mom instilled God's principles in the home. And I did that because I learned how to respect authority and then found out, oh, by the way, that's in God's Word. Amazing. My mom was so concerned about what I would study and hear, she wouldn't allow me to listen to rock music when I was a kid. She only allowed me to listen to symphonies, classical music. She didn't want anything eroding my brain. She wanted to preserve it and make sure anything in was being produced and going out and produce something of righteousness. That's intentional parenting. I think she did a pretty good job. I'm just kidding, kidding. But I think we can all learn to be that kind of intentional person. Grandparents, parents alike, you've got to filter these things because the enemy is only seeking to destroy souls. How serious are we going to take this? So we have to have a right understanding, a right biblical literacy. I will tell you this, that when it comes to biblical literacy, the Bible changes everything. It changes history, it changes nations. When you know the Word of God, it will change the entire environment around you and generations are changed. You know, when uh, we talk about our nation's history of being one nation under God, where did that come from? Well, we say, well, we know that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. But sub deo et lege is the terminology that's coined above Harvard Law School. Under God, under law. This is a terminology that actually went to, from Sir Edward Cox, who's the who would debate this with King James in 1620, and it's etched on the Supreme Court doors to remind the king that the king was under God, otherwise a nation falls under tyranny and justice cannot prevail. That's how important it is that we as individuals and we as a nation must be as being under God. Therefore, it is a right perspective to say, I am going to speak truth in a culture of lawlessness. So again, we're not talking about uh, monetary gain here when we talk about work. We're talking about being called as a Christian to stand in the gap, to be a repairer of the breach. That could be a generational thing. For my wife and I coming from broken homes, it was taking a stand to say, this day forward, we will honor God. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that means in your workplace, it means in your home, it means every sphere of your influence. To God be the glory. You see it as a mission field now rather than an obligation. 
You work at 7-Eleven, I hope that when I go to your 7-Eleven, you're the best customer service person ever that they've had in their history. And you represent Christ well in that. You know that uh, God is a worker, right? God is a worker. So when we talk about work, we got to understand it starts with Him. The work of God is cited throughout the Scripture. He talks about his work in creation, in salvation, in redemption, in provision, in wisdom, in direction, in deliverance, safety, victory, judgment, and more. He's working all these things. And God is a God of work, so is Jesus Christ, because Jesus is also God. He's a worker. He says in John 9, 4 to 5, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 4, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In John 5, 17, he says, my father has been working until now and I have been working. So the Lord is a worker. He, he was there at creation and making all things. John chapter 1, he is sustaining the universe according to Colossians 1. He is active in redemption and judgment. Jesus is a worker. The Holy Spirit is also a worker, as we'd expect as part of the triune God. He's at work at anything that the Father and the Son are doing. And with that understanding, then, who are we to be? Because if God is a worker and Jesus is a worker and the Holy Spirit's a worker, we ought to be a worker as well. And again, it's working everything or whatever we do to God's glory. You know, I thought about my mother as she was tending to grandma. She was a full-time caretaker for our grandmother. That is work. You can work in so many ways, but when you rise to the morning, you need to do it honorably unto the Lord. Lord, what is it that you would have me to do this day? And if we don't understand what our purpose is, you ask him for it. Sometimes it just means staying, Lord, I am, here I am, send me. I don't know what to do today, but I'm asking you for purpose and direction to bring you glory. He will give it. He will give it. You know, and of course, anything that we're talking about here has to be legal work. I, sorry, I just thought about it. It's kind of funny. I, I, could, I could see somebody in here going, yeah, but what if I go work for the mafia? And I'm a Christian for the mafia. Yeah, yeah that'll last like 24 hours, right? You're not gonna, anyway, you got to do something legal, right? Legal unto the Lord. And whatever you're doing, bring it glory to God in anything and everything that you do. He tells us in Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 27, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So man is made in the image of God. God is a worker. Jesus is a worker. The Holy Spirit is a worker. We're created in the image of God. He tells us in Genesis that he made us to work. He says the same thing in Exodus chapter 20. Six days you shall work, and on the seventh day, rest. Now, for those of us who don't understand a work-life balance sometimes, it doesn't mean you work six full days and you take the seventh day off. It means as we look to the Hebrew calendar, we'd see how they'd operate through a day. It's a great example. 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. was all your work had to be done in that. After 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. was time with family around the dinner table. There was no distraction, no TV, no cell phones, no any of those things. It was time with family, four hours dedicated to that. Then you had eight hours of rest and you started over the next day. There was a good work-life balance in that design. But God says six days you work, the seventh day you give wholly to him and rest. Don't take on any work that day. And some might say, well, wait a minute, I thought work was a punishment. I thought that was a curse. You may feel like that sometimes, but actually in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we learn that Adam was told to tend and keep the Garden of Eden. Tend and keep it. There are two words that are used there, avad and shamer. It means to serve, till, service, labor, and work, to watch over. The fall didn't introduce work. It just changed the nature of work. And it changed the nature of the workers. So now we're working against sin in us and the effects of it in our world. Imagine if you just leave your lawn unattended for six months. How would it look? 
Or how would your home look if you left it unattended for six months? Laundry and cleaning and all those things. We know the effects of what happens if we're not laboring even in our own home. But whatever we do, we do it to the glory of the Lord. He says in Colossians 3.23, Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. We need some God-honoring workers out there. We need people who are going to be courteous, who are going to be enthralled to arise to the day to see their jobs as a way to bless somebody because they love the Lord and their joy flows through them. When they answer the phone, they're answering it unto the Lord. When they're mopping the floors, they're doing it unto the Lord, whatever the job may be. If you're a CFO, you're balancing the books unto the Lord. Because through all of these things, we then have a testimony. We've got to be counter-cultural because the world is showing us otherwise. It's an opportunity for the fruits of the Spirit to be exhibited of Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 26. I, you know, let me use another example with regard to your lawn. You know it's biblical to keep your lawn? <laughs> now, on one extreme, it can become a symbol of pride. On one extreme, it can become an idol, and we tend to do that. We will invest ourselves into something that becomes our identity. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about your testimony, an opportunity to influence others. If you're working in your job unto the Lord, people will care about what you say. You'll be a respectable person that they may lean and look to you as a person of character and integrity. Your lawn then can also exemplify that. If you let your lawn go, how does that affect your neighbors? Well, now you've devalued their homes. Your shutters are broken. The weeds are up to your waist. And then you walk out and you're like, let me tell you about Jesus because I'm a disciplined man. <laughs> and then they're looking at the evidence and going, I don't think you're as disciplined as you think you are. Right? So it testifies to give us an opportunity to be mindful of our neighbors in a way to share the gospel. That's all it comes down to. Listen to what Solomon said. Proverbs 24, 30 to 34. I went by the field of the lazy man. Well, right away, we know where we're going. And by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Again, he made all of this assessment based on just the condition of one's lawn. Now, granted, we've had some individuals in our neighborhood who are physically unable to do it. But now there's not a disrespect. Now there's an opportunity. Now the neighbors can actually pull together and say, let's go over there and help them out. Right? It's not because they're not capable. It's because they need help. And there's a great joy to be able to serve our neighbors in that way. So again, Ephesians 6, Colossians 3, remind us we do this unto the Lord to bring about a testimony. That's what he says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Not to come by your lawn and say, hey, that's a really well manicured lawn. No, we want everything we do to be an opportunity to talk about the Lord. And we balance these things accordingly. So here, now we're ready to start the sermon. No, I'm, I'm kidding. We'll move through it fairly quickly. It's fairly cut and dry. It's kind of like reading a proverb where you see it and you go, wow, that makes perfect sense. See, what you have to understand is that Paul is writing into a culture of Greeks who disdained work. They were under the impression by their polytheistic culture that worshiped a bunch of false gods that suggested to them and was replicated within the culture that work was a curse. So if you worked, you were a lower class citizen. If you didn't have to work and just do whatever you want and have somebody give you grapes and fan you all day, that somehow this is the epitome of having elevated yourself in the culture. Complete contrary to what the Word of God says, that God has given you breath to bring Him glory. So he's working against that, and missionaries have to do that. When they go into a culture, there's a bunch of bad habits a bunch of bad things that have already been replicated over and over again. they got to learn it and then tell them how to unlearn that. Start with a radical change, and they teach their children, and suddenly you have a transformation in their midst. you got to give them the truth. So not only that, 
They've got a letter that's been circulating in their midst, falsified from Paul. Somebody fabricated a letter, circulating it, and Paul alluded to it earlier in our study of 2 Thessalonians, that somebody had told them they had already missed the rapture and the second coming. So these people have already been losing jobs, losing social status, their whole lives are turned upside down. The emperor's now involved because of what they're saying is creating uprising. So they're taking on all this persecution, and now you told me I got to go through the wrath of God and I missed the second coming? And they're greatly distraught. So some of them went right back to the old Greek way. What difference does it make? I don't need to work. Yeah, I'm discouraged. Stressed, I don't want to work at all. And then I'm going to become dependent on somebody else. So the Apostle Paul addresses all of us. Let's read it. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 15. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we should not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat." For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but our busy bodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother." It's interesting that the Apostle Paul doesn't use any of the points that I started this whole thing off with. He didn't take them back to Genesis, didn't take them back to Exodus chapter 20, reminding them of God's design for work. He's even the one who gave us Colossians and Ephesians and telling us that we ought to work unto the Lord. He doesn't use any of that. He goes right to it. If you don't work, you don't eat. See, he'd already been dealing with this in that culture that the Greek men coming into the church were leaning toward not working and then not working at all, letting the wives do the work or let others work for them. He said, this is not the way it is. You've got to change the culture, and it starts now. It starts with you. You've got to lead by example. In the Talmud, it says that a strong work ethic distinguishes a man from the ways of the world. It's a right work ethic. We can be imbalanced in our work. We can find our identity in our work, even unto the Lord. I can testify to that. I can make ministry so important that I neglect my wife, that I neglect my children. That's not a right work balance. And that's what the Lord will give us. In Proverbs, he talks a lot about, though, that work ethic. Listen to this. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4. He who has a slack hand becomes poor. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread, but he who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. The desire of the lazy man kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. We need to probably uh, get this up to the White House, don't we? about these matters. Did I say that? I did say that. (laughs) Jesus modeled all of this. Jesus modeled all of these things. He was a worker. When we talk about how Jesus taught the people boldly, but think about this, before he was even a teacher, he was a laborer. He was a tecton, a laborer, a carpenter, a stonemason, a handyman. Any handymen here? (laughs) I know we got a few. I know you're here. You just don't want to let everybody else know that, so we don't call you. There they are. I'm going to find that guy after church, right? Jesus was a foot washer, a chef, an ocean master, a doctor, a miracle worker, a prophet, a teacher, and more. Jesus did it all. 
And he appointed and sanctified these things to bring himself glory, that we also bear the image of the king in all that we do. If anyone's ashamed to wash a toilet, then they're not ready. You got to get on your hands and knees first. You got to be willing to do the hard work. Roll up your sleeves. Be willing to serve the Lord. I tell you, we've got connections for life down here, the food pantry. They don't need people who want to go in and be the rock star. They need somebody who says, you know, I'm just going to roll up my hands, my, my, my hands. <laughs> I'm going to roll up my hands. I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to get to work. I'm going to minister in love, and maybe nobody will even know I'm here. But I'm doing it all to the glory of the Lord. So we've got to have five motives here. Five motives. And I'll try to do this in five minutes or less. Here we go. Number one, healthy fellowship. Healthy fellowship. This is important. If you want to be motivated to work hard, you do it because you want healthy fellowship in the body. He says, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. So he's talking about ceasing fellowship with individuals who are unruly and disorderly. Now, before we go cast all the teenagers out of the church, we probably need to know what this means. Because we'll have a very empty church tomorrow, right? We'll be like, hey, um, we don't want to cast everybody out. But the issue here is what he's talking about is willful disobedience. This is knowing what they ought to do and refusing to do it. It's ataktos. It means out of step, out of sync, disorderly. And this is coming against all of the laziness that Paul is seeing. Men, you're letting the women do the work. Men, you're not arising and leading by example. Men, stand up and do the Lord's work while there is still day. Hey, he's not letting the women off the hook either. <laughs> and he said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 to 12, work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. He has been really hitting on this theme. Be a worker. Lead by example. So number two, you've got to be a good example. You're leading for the next generation. Being a good example, verses 7 to 9. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. He had to undo cultural norms that were unhealthy and show them, and he was a tent maker, and he worked with leather. Some of you don't know it, but I also work another job, and it helps to cover medical expenses. It's a needed thing, and it's good. It keeps grounded. I, I get grieved sometimes when, when pastors uh, become, well, it hurts my heart to see sometimes the abuses, and, and I'm unashamed to work we also ought to have the same spirit of work, right? That we, when, even if nobody ever sees what you do, you're doing it to the glory of the Lord. I don't think I can stress that enough. He says here that they labored and toiled. It's kapas and machtas. It's saying that they worked hard. They toiled to lead by example. So others would see it and go, that's how we're supposed to do it. Thirdly, he makes it clear, it's about survival, You've got to show them a good work ethic, otherwise they'll learn laziness, i.e. children, next generation. This is a scenario of legacy passing. If you don't show them how to do this, where will they learn it from? You can't abdicate it to the schools. You can't abdicate it to the world at large. You have to show them. Lead by example. He says, verse 10, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Robert Bolton, who was a Puritan, he said, idleness is the rust and canker of the soul. We know we want to do something. Sometimes we struggle with what to do. We think that a job just means what do I make money doing? Sometimes the greatest, most fulfilling work is once you retire. Now you can be appointed to something else, something glorious of doing the Lord's work. The Bible is our handbook for how to work. Do you know the Bible is filled with study on agriculture, science, economics, astronomy, governance, warfare, communications, and so much more? 
It is our handbook for life. This book changes everything, but it has to be applied. He told Timothy to tell the Ephesians also another Asia Minor Greek culture where laziness was running rampant. He told them in 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Woo. They have to lead by example. Now, he did tell us we're to look out for widows and orphans too. James chapter 1, verse 27. But in 1 Timothy, he reminds them there's stipulations for that too because we don't want a welfare system. So even for the widows, if they were of age in certain circumstances, that they were to help them to remarry. But to the others, they were to tend to them. Welfare was not the answer. Listen, I'm going to go out on a limb here and tell you this. If the Greeks had actually kept doing everything that Paul said to do here, they wouldn't have become a bankrupt nation by 2015. They were bankrupt. They were defaulting on their monetary lending loans that they had taken from the IMF. Even the rest of the Eurozone didn't want Greece involved because they knew they would drag down the rest of their economies. Some of you have probably ventured over to Greece. You see how beautiful it is, but economically it was devastated. Why? Because they started replacing everything with socialism, handouts, free education, free health care, free. Somebody's got to pay for that. Then the taxes go up. Oh, but nobody wants to pay the taxes. We don't want to work. So then they try to find ways to undercut the taxes. Now the government goes bankrupt because everybody wants free everything. See, Greece became an example to the rest of Europe and all the nations of what not to do. If they just kept doing this of what Paul said, they wouldn't be in the mess that they were in. But you know what's happening? It's happening here too. When Greece began to fall, they were at 179% GDP. That means that almost at two times if we took everybody's paycheck to try to pay off the debt, you'd almost need twice as much to pay it off. And America's doing the same thing. It's an attitude. It's an attitude against work, against governance, against leadership. So number four is we want to do this because we want harmony. We want harmony in the body. 2 Thessalonians 3.11. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but as busybodies. All right. So if we're not working, we're prone to what? Gossip. Ooh, that's a big one. Even when Paul was talking about the widows that they were tending to, if they were of age and could have been remarried and weren't, listen to what he says to Timothy. I didn't write this, so don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> they learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. And you get an issue of this is becomes desperate housewives, <laughs> right? That's what this is. They're unschooled, untrained People who aren't working and, and believing that if God has given them breath today, they have something to do and to put it to work. That's why we have 94 volunteers here at the church. There's always something to do. And some of you may look at me and say, well, I don't know what I can do. Let me tell you, it starts here first with this. You see Heidi over there? Yeah. Heidi has twice the energy of people half her age. Yeah. <laughs> and she gives the best hugs like you can't imagine. If you go into her contraption of these arms, she will squeeze so tight, that's a blessing to us all. When Flo is able to make it to church, she's what, 95? 95. When Flo is here, I teach better. Because she made it an effort just to be, just to be a part. That makes a difference. That's like throwing the rock in the pond, boop, and it changes everything. That's the attitude we ought to have to say, Lord, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do today, but it's, I belong to you. You gave me breath in my body, and I know by even just being there, I've changed something. To you be the glory. So when it comes to retirement, it just means you're moving to another occupation. He says here, verse 12, Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Now, this means that we need to stay busy. And sometimes, even as couples, I can tell, you know, for my wife, she would probably love to be around me all the time. But there are probably some times when she needs a little space from me. And that's okay. That's a good thing. Uh, God has apportioned that. If we're around each other too much, it might be too much. 
You know what I'm saying? We need to stay busy, and that's, that's okay. That's, that's balance. He says here, verse 13, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. When you're doing the Lord's work, you can get tired. Do you know that? When you're tending to God's sheep, it can be exhausting. When you're doing the work of the Lord in ministry and tending to those who are sick and ill, and it can be exhausting. But you don't grow weary. You're laying up treasures in heaven. You get refreshed and you keep doing and you keep serving to God. Be the glory. He says in Galatians 6, 9 to 10, and let those and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And finally, number five, honor. Honor. The motivations to work was a healthy fellowship, being a good example, survival of a culture, harmony, and honor. It doesn't just bring God honor, it brings you honor to work unto the Lord. Verses 14 to 15, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, Note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. He's telling to withdraw. We know that this is a brother or sister in Christ, so we have to handle it rightly, honorably before the Lord, because the goal here would be that they are restored wholly, fully unto the Lord, because godly sorrow produces repentance, according to 2 Corinthians 7. This will bring honor to God. He says in 2 Timothy 2, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for what? Every good work. God has prepared that you produce fruit for the kingdom. You have a purpose. He purposed for us to be here today together to talk about these things, to encourage you. You matter in the kingdom of God. And when you arise tomorrow, seek it out. Lord, to thy glory, I breathe, I serve, I move, and have my being. I would hope that Christians would be the very best workers in the world. Not because you're trying to bring yourself attention, but to whom you serve, God, your King, your Lord. Bring Him all the attention through everything you do to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. As we close, I went a little over. Not too bad. Not too bad. What about six minutes over? Okay. Let's close, and uh, we've got our prayer team, Sheldon and Kimberly. I saw them right here. Oh, you're here. Okay. And they're our prayer team. So if you have a prayer burden, and I'd also encourage you on our bulletin, if you tear that off and you drop it in an agape box, you can tell us your prayer request. We will pray for those on Wednesdays. But today, before you leave here, if you're carrying a burden in here today and you need somebody to pray with you, please pray with our prayer team. They would love to lift these matters up before the Lord on your behalf. So don't leave here and tell you who have done that. Let's pray. Let's sing together and give this day unto the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the study of your word. I know we went a little over. I thank you for all the attention of your saints to your word. I pray, Father, that we would carry these words close to heart and we would model what we preach. May we not be a people of hypocrisy, saying one thing and doing another. But rather, Father, may we be filled up with the Spirit that you put us to task that everything we do today, we do to your glory. May we arise with purpose. When we put our head to pillow at night, may it be that we're fulfilled in having pleased you. I pray that you would help us to cultivate closer communion with you, strengthen us for the day, and may we likewise strengthen others. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please stand if you are able. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Elyon, Adonai, age to age, you're still the same. 
going before us and just making a way, Lord, that we have nothing to fear. Lord, you go before us and just make our path straight. Lord, just give us the words to say of the people that we meet. Lord, just give us the work ethic that comes after your own heart. You are a good God. We serve the one true mighty King. Thank you for your love. It's Jesus' name we pray. 